Voyager 1 will continue transmitting to Earth for years as it disappears into the outer reaches of the solar system. You would think that there could not possibly be any more exciting discoveries made after the Voyager spacecraft's long 46 years of flying through the cosmos, but once again they have come across something that left scientists baffled. Coded communications sent to prospective alien civilizations by Voyager 1 and 2 are NASA's biggest hope of finally making contact with other life forms. But the spacecraft are so much more than this, as they have provided us with a wealth of knowledge regarding the helio sheath, the solar system's outermost layer. But none of this was even intended for them during their initial launch trajectory. What have the Voyager space probes ultimately revealed? Why are these new discoveries so much more exciting than their previous findings? And will anything on the golden recordings ever be discovered by aliens? Let's find out. The American space program went through a transitional era in the 1970s. As the Apollo program came to an end, NASA was attempting to determine the future of manned spaceflight. The Mariner missions sent spacecraft past Mars, Venus and Mercury, as well as occasionally into their orbits, allowing us to learn more about the inner planets. There were unofficial plans to launch a Mariner mission to some of the outer planets, but doing so would require chemical rockets, which would take at least 15 years to develop. During this time, significant developments in the field of gravity-assisted orbital routes were also occurring. The core notion is that a spacecraft can use the gravity of a neighboring planet to give it a significant boost in velocity as long as the spacecraft maintains the correct orbit, even if the math and physics are somewhat complicated. The gravitational pull is stronger and the boost is greater as a planet's mass increases. That implied that a spacecraft could utilize Jupiter's gravity as a slingshot to travel out to study the more distant planets once it had reached Jupiter the most massive planet in our solar system. Gary Flandreau, an engineer, predicted in 1965 that the outer planets will align in the middle of the 1970s, allowing a spacecraft to visit them all using a series of gravity-assisted boosts. In fact, this specific alignment wouldn't happen again until 176 years, making it a once-in-a-lifetime occurrence. It was a remarkable coincidence that this mission's technical feasibility was developed a few years before the planets aligned to make it possible. The Grand Tour was an ambitious project that originally called for sending a number of probes to all of the outer planets. NASA, however, was preparing to create the Space Shuttle, and the project's projected budget was close to $900 million in 1972. The Grand Tour was scrapped in favor of a mission profile with lower expectations as the enormous expenses associated with the shuttle's development grew closer. The Mariner-Jupiter-Saturn mission, MJS, would be an expansion of the Mariner program. The new probes eventually adopted the name Voyager. They were built on the Mariner platform and upgraded with knowledge obtained during Pioneer 10's 1973 flyby of Jupiter. In 1977, the design was finalized. Optimistic engineers at NASA speculated that if the initial journey to Jupiter, Saturn and some of their moons was successful, they could be able to employ gravity-assisted trajectories to reach Uranus and Neptune. The notion of the Grand Tour came to life once more. Two spacecraft, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, would be launched a few weeks apart, according to the final Voyager mission plan. Voyager 1 would scan and take pictures as it flew quite near Jupiter and several of its moons. Jupiter would likewise be passed by Voyager 2, although at a more cautious distance. Both probes would be propelled towards Saturn by Jupiter's gravity if all went according to plan. Then, Voyager 1 would explore Saturn, specifically its rings and the moon Titan. Voyager 1's trajectory would thereafter lead it away from all other planets, out of the ecliptic, the plane of the planet's orbits, and ultimately out of the solar system. While this was happening, Voyager 2 would go to Saturn and several of its moons. It would then be propelled by Saturn's gravity to go to Uranus and Neptune, before also leaving the ecliptic and leaving the solar system, if it was still functioning correctly when that was finished. This was thought to be a long shot, yet amazingly, everything went according to schedule. On August 20th, 1977, Voyager 2 was launched from Cape Canaveral, Florida, using a Titan Centaur rocket. On September 5, 1977, Voyager 1 was launched. Why was the numbering inverted? 
Voyager 1 overtook Voyager 2 on the way to the outer planets and arrived at Jupiter first. The numbering does not correspond to the launch sequence because NASA believed that if Voyager 2 began transmitting first, the public would get confused. What sort of equipment did the Voyagers bring into space? The cameras on board the Voyagers may be the most important equipment in the eyes of the general population. The cameras, which are also mounted on the instrument boom, have an 800x800 resolution and come in both wide-angle and narrow-field varieties. The cameras provided us with previously unseen views of our solar system and unheard-of images of the distant planets, including the famous departure shot that captured both Earth and its moon in one frame. The camera boom could be independently relocated from the rest of the ship. The Voyager's computer system was equally outstanding. Engineers created a self-repairing computer system since they knew the vessel would be on its own most of the time and that the interval between a command and a response from Earth would grow longer the further into space the craft travelled. The Voyagers themselves collected all the data, but there were also significant mission components on the ground. In order to better identify the Voyagers' transmissions as they travelled farther into the outer solar system, NASA upgraded a global network of radio receiving stations. In order to maintain nearly constant communication, a network of 230-foot, 70-meter radio dishes pulls in Voyager data and sends signals out to it. Despite having a lifetime mission cost of over $750 million, the Voyager spacecraft had returned enough scientific material by 1989 to fill 6,000 volumes of the Encyclopedia Britannica. The science modules on board were selected from submissions made by research teams from all throughout the US. The knowledge we gained from the Voyager missions concerning Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune, as well as many of their moons, was extensive in both amount and influence. It affected public ideas of the solar system, influenced science textbooks in schools across the US, and established the framework for the current space program. Voyager is largely responsible for the knowledge we have of the outer planets, not to mention the countless pictures taken from viewpoints people have never previously encountered. The public's desire for further space exploration was stoked by those stunning photos of Jupiter and Saturn. Voyager provided additional information on a number of topics, including Jupiter's weather, the rings around Jupiter, Saturn and Uranus, volcanic activity on Jupiter's moon Io, the masses and densities of Saturn's moons, the atmospheric pressure on Titan, Saturn's largest moon, Uranus's magnetic field, and the Great Dark Spot, a persistent weather system on Neptune that is as big as Earth. It was 1989 when Voyager 2 arrived at Neptune. Since the original mission's launch more than 10 years prior, several of the scientists involved had left their positions. Jupiter, Saturn and Uranus were all visited by Voyager in 1979, 1981 and 1986 respectively. So, where are they now? The two Voyagers aren't together. In relation to how Earth is oriented outside of the solar system, Voyager 1 is traveling in the north while Voyager 2 is traveling in the south. They both entered the Heliosheath, the solar system's outermost region, in 2007. There, the solar wind collides with interstellar magnetic fields to create a shockwave boundary. Astronomers' first understanding of the size and location of the heliosheath came from the Voyager spacecraft as they passed through the shockwave and returned with data. Voyager 1 exited the solar system on August 25, 2012, according to a report from the project's scientists on September 21, 2013. Even though some of the Voyager's equipment are no longer functional, they are still sending back vital data. You can get a rough idea of how incredible these spaceships are by picturing a car that has been driving continuously since 1977. Radio waves need more than 14 hours to travel at the speed of light from the Sun to Earth at their current distance. The craft's orienting thrusters are out of fuel, and as their plutonium depletes over the next several years, they will need to shut off some of their sensors. While doing so, they will continue to travel at a speed of nearly 30,000 miles per hour, 48,280 kilometers per h, for tens of thousands of years, arcing out toward the Milky Way. They won't corrode in space since there is no atmosphere, and there isn't much of anything in interstellar space for them to collide with. Before they ever approach another star within a distance of a light year, it will take them around 40,000 years. It's possible that the Voyagers will be journeying for millions or perhaps tens of thousands of years. 
What if the Voyagers come across an advanced alien society in the future? Well, we've left them a message. NASA believed it could be a good idea to include some sort of message to any intelligent aliens who might someday locate them after realizing that the Voyagers would eventually journey outside of our solar system. These messages were created by a group under the direction of Carl Sagan. They are stored on copper discs that have been gold-plated and etched to resemble vinyl record albums. A portion of the disc is dedicated to audio content, which includes a selection of music, greetings in 55 different languages, some of which are extremely obscure or long extinct, and various natural sounds. The discs also contain 122 images that are encoded as vibrations on the discs, along with decoding instructions. Each disc's cover plate features a number of symbols. A stylus and mounting platter are also included that represent the way the record is played back. The image start signal, the aspect ratio of the images, and a copy of the first image are described in the image decoding instructions, allowing the aliens to check their work. The picture is completed with a star map that makes Earth's location very evident. The fragment of uranium-238 attached to the main bus next to the record can be examined by aliens if they are curious about how long Voyager has been traveling. The length of time the sample has been in space could then be determined by analyzing the isotope ratios, provided they are aware of the half-life of uranium-238. When they play the album, what music will the aliens hear? Mostly traditional music from various countries, including African ritual music, Scottish bagpipes, and Native American chants. It also functions as a sort of classical music greatest hits compilation. The most recent tunes are Chuck Berry's Johnny B. Good and a jazz composition by Louis Armstrong. Maps of Earth, photos of the other planets in our solar system, pictures of different animals, and even pictures of people are among the many different images on the record. The record was the subject of a book by Carl Sagan titled Murmurs of Earth. Many years later, a companion CD-ROM was also available. The Pioneer 10 and Pioneer 11 plaques are comparable to the Voyager discs, though the designers of the Voyager discs took extra care to ensure that aliens could decode them. The information on the Pioneer plaque was beyond the comprehension of many Earth scientists. When the Voyager disc was discovered, several people expressed worry that any hostile aliens would have a map that would take them right to Earth. The situation isn't particularly urgent though, as the Voyagers will spend tens of thousands of years in interstellar space before they are even close to another star. If the discs are ever discovered, they might be so distant in the future that we are already extinct. Thanks for watching another episode of Voyager. While you're still here, make sure to click the video on your screen for more mind-blowing videos about space.